It is the pastor's heart and Dominic Steele and the fight that is needed for pastors. Our guest is Peter Orr. Uh, there is a fight on for pastors' hearts, ministry and joy. Discouragement and opposition weigh heavily. Dane Ortland says pastors are under unique and unremitting pressures. Peter Orr says there is a crisis amongst pastors. Pastoral work, he says, will only be a joy and sustainable if people self-consciously reciprocate the love and encouragement that is extended by the pastor to the congregation. Peter Orr is a New Testament lecturer at Sydney's Moore Theological College. He has this new book out, Fight for Your Pastor. It has seven active words, fight, encourage, listen, give, forgive, submit, and check. He's with me today on The Pastor's Heart. And Peter, thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me, Dominic. You, you train pastors, and yet you say there is a crisis amongst pastors. Yes, I mean, that's my observation, uh, just uh, looking at Sydney, but particularly uh, looking you know, across the Western world, uh, the, you know, the pressure that all Christians are under in terms of the, uh, the way that our culture becomes more uh, hostile to Christianity, but I think pastors in particular bear the brunt of that. Mm, you picking up on a, uh, a Rory Shiner line, that's right. say there's been a change in the weather. Yes, yeah, so Rory uh, uses the illustration of the climate and the weather, you know, the, the um, uh, you know, it might be raining uh, on a particular day and you can deal with that. But when the when the climate changes, um, that's you know, when things are more serious. And, and he sort of uses that that image is that the climate is changing. The, the opposition is increasing. And I think as Christians, we all feel that. But I think those in Christian leadership feel it most acutely. And particularly the evangelical, the complementarian. Correct. The and- one whose views perhaps um, is most out of line, out of step with uh, the wider world. Sexual ethics, gender, yep. those kind of things. Uniqueness yeah. of Christ. Yep. Your pastor's heart or your heart for pastors, um, quite early on in the book, you talk about a couple of friends that have particularly been through the fulcrum. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in, in writing the book, I spoke to a number of friends uh, here in Australia, overseas, and you know, ne- nearly everyone had stories of a war story, <laughs> war, war stories, yeah, and difficulties. And I think, I think particularly the last few years with COVID, uh, you know, e- everyone's find the last few years difficult. But I think, uh, you know, many pastors have find it acutely difficult mm. uh, that that uh, things, the sort of the the normal rough and tumble of, of ministry gets uh, ramped up and is more acute, and they're they're kind of dealing with. Uh, the things that we're all dealing with, but also trying to to shepherd, um, yeah, shepherd the congregations through that. Mm, yeah. My, um, I always thought energy and optimism were my secret power, the thing that kept me from burnout. But here I am struggling to function and on four weeks of medical leave to recover mm. from it all. I'm not fully aware of what caused it. I just think the collective toll of a thousand difficulties and mm. disappointments. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so throughout the book, um, there, there are kind of quotes and um, little vignettes from, from different pastors from around the world. And, you know, look, there are wonderful encouragements, but there are these, uh, these hard uh, struggles mm. that uh, I imagine many, many pastors will be able to relate to. Mm. You talk about fighting in prayer, mm. and, um, and yet it is difficult because um, I find as a pastor, I can't share my prayer points authentically yeah. Yeah. because most of my prayer points are to do with other people's problems. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, someone in, you know, in the book mentions that, that uh, sometimes the most the things that weigh on them the most heavily are the things that they can't share with other people because they're helping uh, you know a, a family through a very kind of private but you know, very acute mm. uh, crisis, but you know, the pastor can't share the details with anyone else. Uh, so it is, it is hard. I think uh, the thing that, that I was struck again uh, in, in, prepare, in working on the book was, you know, the Apostle Paul, someone that we, you know, may, maybe we're kind of tempted to put up on a pedestal and think of as this, this sort of super Christian who had it all together, how often he asks and pleads almost for people to, to pray for him. You know, one Corinthian, 2 Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.11, you know, you must help us by your prayers. Mm. Uh, Philippians 1, you know, my, your prayer, my deliverance, you know, your, your prayers will lead to my deliverance. There's a, 
uh, there is a real uh, understanding on Paul's part that he needs and, and covets, to use that kind of old mm. language, you know, the prayers of the, the congregations that he's ministering to. Mm. I, um, I, I mentioned here a couple of weeks ago in a mm. thing the day I almost resigned episode, um, coming back from stress leave and uh, preaching on 2 Corinthians. Mm. And I'd actually preached on 2 Corinthians twice before but I had never understood it. <laughs> and then here coming back from stress leave mm. and, um, and just realizing, oh, Paul went through a catastrophe with yeah. his congregation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, got to the point where he said, you know, we despair even of life itself. Yeah. Yeah. Two Corinthians in some ways, is, it's, the pastor's, uh, it's the pastor's book because you, you, Paul sort of opens his heart much more than... Um, uh, in, in any of his other letters and uh, very, very open with the Corinthians, uh, you know, a point sort of says, you know, we're, we're opening our heart. We're just, you know, asking you to return your affection to us. And um, yeah, they're a good model, I think, uh, a good model for pastoral ministry. I don't know if this is helpful to say. I, I was walking home from here across Parramatta Road and I stopped at Parramatta Road. And for those outside Sydney, that's a big road. And uh, I stopped at the traffic lights and uh, this bus zoomed past. This is right in the moment of everything going yeah. wrong. And just missed me by that much. Yeah. And uh, I just thought, oh, wouldn't that have been awesome to have had an early mark to heaven? <laughs> and, uh, and it wouldn't have been suicide? Because it wouldn't it have been an accident. <laughs> yep. well, and, yeah. and, and, and I just got an insight into live as Christ to die as gain. Yeah. I, yeah. I stay. Yeah. I stay for... Yeah, for your sake, Paul says in Philippians one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, he, and that's very striking that he says, you know, I would, I'd much rather be with Christ, but I'm convinced that I'll stay for your sake. So his love for, you know, the people that he's serving is is even greater than his desire to be with Christ. Very mm. striking. Uh, Colosh, uh, uh, two Corinthians one. You know, again, he talks about despairing of life itself. So there is a depth to Paul that I think is is uh, is a helpful model. Um, for, for, yeah, and so when absolutely. I'm finding it hard, I can actually look. I mean, when yeah. he says, look at my example as yeah, I follow yeah, Christ, yeah. he's not just talking about look at my example. And yeah. He's talking about as yeah. I'm struggling in the depths yeah. of despair. Yeah, yeah. Not just my triumphs. Yeah. Mm. Um, your second action word is encourage. Mm. And you note that complaining and grumbling in the congregation is not just a 20th century phenomenon. No, no, it goes all the way back to the to the desert, Israel in the desert, uh, complaining against leaders. Um, yeah, uh, it, it seems to be something, we, you know, we, we all, um, I think we have a predisposition to, to complain and to complain against leaders. And so in, in that chapter, I talk about the, the negative of, of being much more careful with what we say. Uh, but also the positive of um, yeah being intentional in giving encouragement to our to our pastors. Mm. And I think I'm very good at seeing what the person above me is doing wrong. Yep. <laughs> and yeah. How they could be improved. Yeah. 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 And I think we default to um, yeah commenting. Uh, and, and even if we do it graciously and carefully, bringing things to people's attention when, when, they're, when they're doing them wrong, but we just assume that if they're doing it right, well, we don't need to say anything. And in fact, a, a pastor friend um, shared with me the other week uh, that someone actually said that to him, um, said, I only say things to you when things are going wrong, because when you're doing, w when, when things are going right, you're just doing your job. So there's this assumption that uh, we don't need to encourage uh, people. And yet, again, the scriptures, the New Testament is full of the language of encouragement. And we need to, we need to in uh, I think, and this is as much for me as anyone else, we need to be intentional in verbalizing our encouragement to one another but also to, to those in leadership over us. Once one leader mentioned that he doesn't provide positive feedback or encouragement about my preaching ministry so that I don't get proud and sin, he also mentioned that as a leader, he saw his role as being the check and balance against the pastor. Yeah. What's wrong with that statement? <laughs> uh, you know, there's, uh, well, it's, it's unscriptural because, you know, we're commanded to encourage one another. We're uh, uh, commanded to build one another up with our words. 
And also, you know, it sounds a little bit like uh, that brother's kind of a self-appointed, um, mm. you know, guardian. And that, again, I don't think that's uh, that's scriptural. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, it's it's just so discouraging. I mean, talking again, or, you know, pastor friends all over the world. It's it's that it's that sort of unthinking criticism that is the thing that's you know it's the it's the dripping tap that just um, that just wears them down. Mm. Yeah. Third active word, listen. And uh, you make the point um, that Jesus first made in the parable of the soils, but um, that there are two sorts of listeners, those who actively engage, approach Jesus for explanation and are rewarded with insight, and those who half-heartedly listen to what he said and then wander off and are left outside. Yeah, talk to me about that. Yeah, so this idea that, um, you know, as, as we listen, as we actively listen, we, you know, we, we, we grow in understanding. Um, it, it, it is what Jesus said. Uh, Vaughan Roberts uses the, the wonderful illustration of automatic doors that uh, automatic doors open as you move towards them. If you just stand there, they, they won't open. And I think Jesus with the parables, that, that's the way the parables function. Those, the disciples who, who come to Jesus for explanation, who are hungry to know more, have the, the, the kind of truths of the parables opened up for them. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's not too much of a stretch to sort of uh, make that a, a general principle about how we, um, you know, how we listen to sermons, how we read the Bible, that if we're expectant, if we're hungry, we'll grow. If we're half-hearted uh, or half-asleep, we, we won't. Um, and the, the, the sermon experience will be kind of, well, you know, will be frustrating for us. Uh, we'll, we'll drift off. We'll, we, we won't get anything out of it. And then we'll sort of think that it's the preacher's fault for not entertaining us. And then there's a little bit of a feedback loop um, because the, you know, we, we'll almost create this expectation that, that the sermon needs to be entertaining and, and sort of engaging in a worldly sense. Whereas if we approach it as a spiritual exercise and, and we listen and uh, we're dependent on God as we listen, uh, well, then we, we I, I think, uh, implicitly encourage our pastors to preach sermons that will kind of open up God's word for us rather than entertain us. You told a story of a guy, they said, Peter's going to come and speak to us. And a guy gets up out of his chair and goes up to buy a coffee. <laughs> yeah, so it was as I was, uh, as I was preaching, um, uh, you know, as I started, a uh, person went off and I thought, you know, that, that often happens, you know, people go uh, to the bathroom, go to the bathroom or whatever, yeah. but I uh, came back in, um, yeah, 10 minutes later with, uh, you know, a couple of takeaway coffees. Now, I want to be gracious. Now, maybe he'd had a really hard night and whatever. So he'd spent the first 10 minutes of your sermon <laughs> in the coffee shop yeah. queue, a couple of doors down the road yeah. from your yeah. church. <laughs> and, you know, I want to be gracious and say, you know, it might have been hard, but it, it just sort of struck me that, um, that sort of thing can happen, you know, all, all too often. And you know, you, as someone who preaches a lot more than me, you'll you'll know that you know the, well, the actually, person who falls the, asleep. Or uh, when I read that story in this book, I felt encouraged yeah. <laughs> because I was remembering this retired guy at our church who would um, who'd turn up here. And he'd pick up a cross of the a copy of the denominational magazine as yeah. he walked in each week. And week one. As I started to preach, he'd be in the back row and he'd open it up. And he'd start, he'd read the first eight pages. And then week two, he'd be put it back on the way out. And then week two, he'd pick it up and read page 16, page eight to 16. And, and yeah. at some stage, I worked up my courage to talk to him about not reading the newspaper while nice. I was preaching. <laughs> I mean, you could try uh, George Whitfield's tactic. So uh, George Whitfield noticed uh, someone falling asleep in uh, in the second row so he he took off his shoe banged it on the pulpit and said i must and i will be heard now, now you could try that but maybe that wouldn't go down so well in 21st century uh, <laughs> australia yeah yeah okay that's yeah <laughs> maybe not <laughs> um uh, give is your third word yep. yeah uh and you know wonderfully in you know in our context at uh in sydney um, I think perhaps that's less of an issue than talking to friends around the world or friends in uh, in other denominations where there's sort of not uh, such a sort of well-organized structure uh, for uh, you know 
Uh, pastoral pain. benchmarks for pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so I tell the story of someone who um, went into a meeting to discuss the pay with their uh, their elders, and came out of the meeting, and uh, you know the elders, one of the elders said, "Oh, you know, if you'd pushed harder, you know, you, you didn't meet our our kind of." Uh, um, we were prepared to give you up. To this, yeah, 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 exactly. What we were prepared to give you, and and uh, that's just the wrong uh, the wrong way to look at it, and obviously. Um, you know, churches need to be as generous as they as they can be, and yeah, I talk a little bit about you know if, if a church is worried that they're they're paying the the, the, the minister too much, that's probably a, a that's a better error to fall into, and then they can trust the minister to be generous in, in even you know giving it back to the church or giving it to other ministries if if they feel that they're being paid too much. But as I talk to people, it's it's that's not normally the that's not normally the problem. Yeah, mm. yeah. It's interesting. Um, uh, you also talk about scrutiny of the way the pastor and the pastor's family yep. spend their money. Yeah. You had a couple of illustrations there. Um, well, do you, what, you give your one. Yeah. So the, the one that's in the, in the book is a, um, a, a pastor's children being quizzed on how much pocket money they, uh, you know, they received and by, by other children in the church and the, the children saying to the pastor's children, well, you know, because obviously it's, it's our parents who give money to the church. And so that's, it's our parents paying your pocket money, and we just want to make sure that you don't get more pocket money than, than we do. So this kind of, yes, yeah, scrutiny um, uh, in certain you know contexts, having your having your pay kind of up on the screen um, and to be discussed at a, you know in an annual general meeting, it's it's yeah it's uncomfortable, um, and it's also very very hard to to raise the issue if if, if um, you know you feel that you haven't you know. You, you know, you haven't had a, a raise in sort of, you know, five, ten years. And, and, you know, with inflation, that means that you're getting paid less. And you, and you, less, feel, yeah. you feel like you're being ungodly in, in raising it. And I've, again, speaking to a few. You've friends, actually had friends who've yeah, spoken like that. Yeah, yeah, who sort of said they feel uh, very uncomfortable. But, you know, that to care for their family, they needed to, to raise it. And again, it, um, I, I'm sure it's not, it's not intentional at all. It's just... Um, Perhaps members of the church or the church leadership not thinking um, actively. Look, we need to be, you know, uh, which is actually being part of generous. what I found helpful about this. I mean, I, at one level, I was reading it to be helped by me on my journey. But at another level, I was thinking, what impact would it have if the leadership team of my church read this book in terms of their thinking about how they engage with us? I was just thinking though about um, different sized churches. Mm. Um, when you get to the size staff team that we've got, I think you giving to village church is a little bit less connected to kind yeah. of yeah. how each individual staff member spends their money. Yeah. Although yeah. I remember when our ministry was much, when it was really just me, do you know, mm -hmm. it kind of felt, well, pretty clearly if you're giving to this ministry, you're giving to Dominic, yeah. do you know? And, yeah. and I actually did feel, I remember um, a long time ago, I bought a hands-free phone mm. um, and it was I was working from home and it meant if I was on the phone it was before mobile phones it yeah, meant yeah. if somebody rang I could actually in the phone call go and make a cup yeah. of coffee while the, yeah. while the phone calls on you know yeah. we take that for granted yeah. on mobile phones today <laughs> but rather than be tied to the desk for every phone call I bought a yeah. hands-free phone and um, I think it was $450 or something it was quite a lot of money mm. 25 years ago yeah yeah and um, somebody said somebody one of our givers said oh they kind of raised their eyebrows yeah. about now i thought it was massively help yeah. to many hours on the phone yeah. before yeah, mobile yeah. phones um anyway i then went around to his house and he had an automatic watering system on his in his backyard yeah. something i would never have done yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and so there was a judgment on me yeah for a hands-free yeah. phone yeah and yet they yeah. had now I oh no, what I've got to not do is not judge him yep. on how he spends his pay, yeah. and he's got to not judge yep. me on how I spend my pay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are a number of pastors talk in the book about how difficult it is to talk about money. I mean, we all, we all know it. It's it's very difficult to to raise um, uh, to raise it. But you know, for, as a congregation member, I want to be as generous as possible, and uh, in a sense, then leave it to the integrity of the pastor who I trust to, to, to spend their money wisely, mm. carefully. Forgive yeah. your pastor. Yeah, so that's a chapter, uh, I guess we can, we can think about 
ways that a pastor might sin in you know kind of three different ways. There's the there's the kind of criminal way that you know where the the, the police and the denominational authorities need to be informed. Mm-hmm. In, in one sense, that then we're we're out of the picture. Then there's the, the way that might disqualify a pastor. So uh, you know ad- adultery. You know that's if the police aren't interested, but you know that would that would disqualify a pastor. Mm-hmm. But then there's the there's the uh, you know all the, the human sort of things. bumping you, up yeah, into exactly yeah. yeah any relationship will have those kind of bumps and and you know the pastor will have a bad day and it might sort of slightly snap at you or you know be be kind of looking past you while they're talking to you, all you know all those sort of things and those, those so I'm not talking about the kind of uh, I'm not saying that we should overlook the, the the other two kind of categories of things but it's the forgiveness and it's the being willing to to overlook those things because scripture says. Uh, that some sins, um, the way to deal with them is to overlook them and mm-hmm. to, to, to bear them. And that not every kind of um, wrong thing that your pastor does needs to be sort of, you know, scrutinized and analyzed and, and kind of formally dealt with or anything like that. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that, you know, it's true of any relationship, but I think it, it's, uh, it, yeah, it needs to be true of us as congregation members towards our pastors who, who will inevitably let us down and to have a forgiving attitude in that relationship, as we should have in any relationship, I think is, is very important for a healthy, functioning church. Your pastor snapped at you. No, that's it. That's my, my pastor would never snap at me. Um, but, um, you know, that that's an il- illustration of... Um, uh, so what have you had to forgive your pastor for? <laughs> very little. My pastor is a very godly man. He's an incredibly patient man. Um, your pastor in the generic sense of the last 30 years. In the last 30 <laughs> years. Um, I had a pastor uh, a, a long time ago in a different country who was very forgetful. And I, I talk about him in, in the book and, and there's some kind of humorous stories of how much he would forget. He would, um, you know, he would forget that he'd talk to you about something mm. or... Uh, you know, he he would even you know you'd you'd bring people along and he'd forget that he'd met them the week before, um, and you know that that's that's just uh, was just a kind of human frailty. Um, now I find that for me, when my tank is full, I make more of those mistakes. Interesting. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, it, yeah. It, it it's just trying to think about the relationship with your pastor in the way that you would um, think about your relationship with a friend, a family member. Um, yeah, there are going to be disappointments, and um, yeah, forgiveness is yeah is important for ev- every relationship. Yeah. What about the congregation submitting to um, uh, their pastor? I mean, yeah. it's interesting. You talk about the issue of the awkwardness of money. I think the awkwardness of teaching the congregation to submit to me is even more of an awkward yeah. topic yeah. than the teaching them because because yeah. actually. Um, uh, to give to God and his causes yep. is something at least in principle a little detached to me whereas yeah. submit to me is yep. actually yep. and yet that is what Hebrews says yep. yeah. no absolutely and uh, submit to your leaders and obviously what does it look like yeah. I mean it's it's submit it's like you know submission uh, in the, the different spheres that scripture talks about is always submission uh, under God, and so it's submitting to our leaders, our, our pastors, when they, um, yeah, teach God's word and, and call us to obey God's word. So it's a submission to them as they, you know, uh, preach Christ, as they call us to obey the the word. I don't think it's, um, uh, you know, as uh, yeah, any submission in the Bible. No submission in the Bible is an absolute mm. kind of unqualified submission. Mm. So I think that's the same in the pastoral relationship. How? Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking. I don't know that we've preached very. I mean, as, as I was reading this, I was thinking. Well, when we got to Hebrews 13 a couple of years ago, I think we had a student minister preach, or I'm not yeah. sure, but I didn't preach yeah, it. Yeah. And um, and in um, I think it's 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm pretty sure I didn't preach that either. Do you know? Yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah. Oh, maybe I did, but it's a long time ago. But we've hardly ever touched on it yeah. in the last decade. Yeah. And where have you seen a pastor, a regular pastor of a congregation, teach on that well and actually yeah. kind of help to educate the congregation to yeah. do that? I mean, I, in terms of teaching it all well, I'm not sure, but in terms of modeling it, uh, I've seen in in a 
different um, different context. Um, something that could be quite controversial is changing service times. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know you can be as a family, you know, say ten o'clock suits you really well, mm. but for different reasons the the kind of the pastor thinks we, we're going to need to move you know to to eleven o'clock. Yeah. And you know that that's a that's a context where you. you it's know, not gospel right no, or wrong. It's, it's a ministry strategy it's a, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, and that's where you know you you might you know it, it might be a bit harder for your family, but you, you're going to have to submit. And and the way that I saw it uh, done well, actually very well, and this is not possible in 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 every context. Was the the minister actually went and spoke to every family in the congregation and mm -hmm. explained. Look, I'm not just doing this to make things awkward. Here are the reasons mm -hmm. why why we're doing it. And so when the when the discussion that you know the the kind of whole church discussion came, there was very little uh, opposition to it. You know, a few people still said, "Look, I, you know, I'm I don't think this is a good idea." But in the end, it w it went through. And so that that was that was a, an example of a pastor understanding that this is going to be hard for people in their congregation in in his congregation. And he took the time to, to talk to them all individually. Now, I know that's not possible when mm. you've got a massive... But that church. wasn't actually the, the people choosing to... I mean, he, he really went beyond the... Pay, yeah, beyond he, the yeah, he the did. And, and in the end, it, it actually made it, it probably easier for him, you know, overall. Like, if he, if he hadn't taken the time to have those conversations and just kind of... Um, you know, drop, dropped it on the congregation. It may, maybe it would have been kind of a harder, uh, a harder thing to, to, to go through. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about it. Submit to your leaders as they keep watch over your souls. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've found the people who have been most complex there have been the people, I mean, there's not that, there's maybe only one at the moment, but um, who's kind of in one of our small groups but doesn't come to our church. Yeah. And, and I think, I'm keeping watch over your soul somehow, and I don't yeah. even yeah. see you or yeah, know you. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they probably yeah. don't even see me as their pastor. You know? No, no, exactly. That's a very hard kind of um, complex situation that probably comes from the fact that we, you know, there's so many good churches around and people mm. go to different churches for different reasons. I'm going yeah. beyond the remit of your book. <laughs> <laughs> um, check your pastor. And this is yeah. really when there's been serious pastoral yeah. sin. Yeah. You know? yeah. And this would be the, the kind of two other categories that I talked about. Uh, although really the, the kind of criminal category, that's the, that's where you just sort of you inform the police, you inform the denominational authorities, and in a sense it's kind of out of the congregation's hand except for uh, you know praying praying for the the pastor. You know the the, the tricky uh, trickier situation is that that middle area, particularly where there's an accusation made against a pastor, and I I. I try to sort of uh, go through the, the, mm. the kind of biblical material on that, and um, yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, and you know, as a congregation member, you know, you're 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 really sort of not not involved, and so the only thing you can do is, I think, pray for both parties. You know, if if there is a an accusation, you pray for both parties. You don't jump to conclusions until uh, you know the the matter has been. Um, yeah, the matter's been discussed and um, and resolved. Um, and again, yeah, to be prayerful, to be prayerful in the midst of it all. Mm. Um, a couple of things here. Uh, you talk about um, uh, past. It's, you say, if the tendency in the past was to automatically believe the pastor and sideline the victim, often with devastating consequences, the danger these days is that we overcorrect and believe the pastor is guilty by default. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, I, I don't want to make that a kind of, um, you know, an absolute statement. It is a tendency, uh, possibly, um, and, you know, both tendencies, are both both extremes are wrong. Um, we, it, you know, it's not our job to, to jump to conclusions that, you know, the New Testament holds out um, a, a process, that there has to be a process. Um, and there can't be an assumption of guilt uh, before that process is played out. Mm. Yeah. Um, public rebuke of mm. the pastor. Um, yeah. Where have you seen that done well? I don't know if I have, actually. Um, I don't know if I have. Um, and perhaps that's, um, yeah, 
perhaps it's the sort of thing that could be done at, at a denominational level, but I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if I've seen that well, and and I wonder if uh, you know, one Timothy envisages um, you know elders, leaders in the church, uh, re, you know, rebuking one another, and so it uh, being less less of a major thing. I think for us, you know, to, to, to kind of see a pastor being rebuked would be a, you know would be a major thing. But maybe if uh, if we had more of a culture of owning up to our mistakes and and receiving rebuke, and I think not just at the pastoral level, but for all of us, then you know it wouldn't be such a big thing. Um, because I think uh, you know one Timothy um, envisages the situation where a pastor is rebuked. Uh, but then would continue in, in, in ministry. I think we, we sometimes think this this kind of process. If if the pastor is guilty, that's that's it. And certainly there are a and number. And there's a big of, there, there are a number of, of things, culture going yeah, on. Yeah, there's there. a number. Of, there will be a number of issues where that would be the case. It would be inappropriate for them mm. to continue in pastoral ministry. But there may be things where they have done the wrong thing, and it, it merits a, a, a rebuke. It might merit some time out of ministry, but then they would uh, they would go back in. I think we 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 don't necessarily operate with that. Um, you know that middle phase. It's either you know you're you're guilty and therefore you stepped on from ministry, for, uh, if, which I want to affirm that of course there are you know many things that that would be true of, but there may be uh, things where it's it's um, still significant. Uh, perhaps the way you've treated your staff or the way that you've uh, you know treated a congregation member that's been ungodly, but not disqualifying, and that might be a category where the, where a rebuke could be called for. I remember discussion sometime, and I mean, you're a New Testament lecturer, so I'll just check with you on this. Um, somebody pointing out to me that um, those who sin be publicly rebuked, yeah. it was present continuous. Um, and so I then thought those who sin and are unrepentant when challenged, or, but, but you were just speaking as if it was um, an action. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I, think, I think that would be the, it, it, it would be more of a, a um, you know, a, a, a one-time rebuke rather than a, um, in the context of ongoing sin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, I think it's it's very difficult, and you know, it's, it's very easy for me as a New Testament lecturer to kind of, in a sense, sort of uh, talk about this in 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 theory. You know, putting it into practice, I, I realize is is uh, is hard and difficult. Um, but I think we need to, um, yeah, try try to. You know, put these principles that 1 Timothy lays out for us into practice. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Peter Orr. He's a uh, lecturer in New Testament at Sydney's Moore Theological College. The new book that is out, Fight for Your Pastor. <laughs> it's funny, I feel a little awkward going and buying copies for my church council. But um, <laughs> I mean, maybe if you're not a pastor and you want to go and buy a few copies for people around your church and just leave them lying around. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart. We will look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon. <laughs>